It's not unusual for residents of the Blindbrook watershed to get plenty of rain. In fact, 48 inches of it falls here in the average year. It replenishes our rivers and streams, keeps our plants green, nurtures our wildlife, and freshens the air. But at times, that rain has turned ugly. In the spring of 2007, the banks of Blind Brook overflowed twice. Water rushed down city streets in Rye and submerged cars. It flooded not only basements, but main floors as well, causing 80 to 100 million dollars in damage in Rye alone. What is the worst of it? Knowing that it is going to happen again. Obviously, we can't stop the rain but each of us can influence the damage it does. This video is aimed at people who own property in the Blind Brook watershed. Our brook flows through the campus of Purchase College. It winds around and flows through Rye Brook and downtown Rye, past the Nature Center, then into Milton Harbor and the Long Island Sound. That means your land ultimately drains into the same body of water as your neighbors. If you live in a watershed, you are interconnected completely by the water. How did flooding in our watershed become such a problem? A century ago, southern Westchester was predominantly natural. Most of the land was forest, or open spaces like marshes, pastures, farmers' fields, and orchards. Rainwater would hit the leaves of the plants, and any excess would trickle down the trunk or stems, and finally seep back into the soil. The water would be filtered by vegetation and then flow slowly into our streams. But as we know, present-day Sound Shore communities are much different than the natural systems they used to be. In the last century, our population has more than tripled. Wetlands and forests have given way to mile after mile of houses, creating the neighborhoods we love, the stores where we shop, and the roads we travel. Every time we construct a new building or addition, build a new highway, put in a parking lot or a sidewalk or a driveway, we add to the flooding. All these surfaces are impervious. That means rainwater cannot seep into them. This model neighborhood created by Purchase College student Chris Mignon makes it clear. So imagine that it is raining and we have equal amounts of water here. I'm going to pour this one into an area that is a forest. The green sponges represent forest. And I want you to note that there is practically no runoff. Now, this is representing not only impervious surfaces like roofs and roads and driveways, but also very short cropped lawn. And this is what happens when it rains. The runoff rushes down the storm drain and causes flooding. But there are ways to slow it down. Let's begin with the easiest and least expensive, redirecting the water from your downspouts. Downspouts that spill into your driveway or sidewalk can significantly contribute to flooding. During a heavy storm, each downspout can dump 10 gallons of rainwater per minute down your property and into the storm drain. But at Rich Philippi's house, that doesn't happen. The water comes off the roof, it goes into these downspouts, straight into my PVC piping, which takes it out and runs it into the garden. Once it gets to the garden, it flows through perforated pipes that lie on the ground, slowly and gently watering the plants. Joy Reidenberg used to have water seeping into her basement. You can see where the paint has eroded away because there's moisture in this area. And it was actually flowing along the floor here. Now when it rains, water from the downspouts has a different place to go. A small gravel pathway allows the water to flow downhill, across the yard, and into drains at the bottom of the driveway. From there, an underground pipe takes it out into wetlands behind her house. Many smart homeowners are also reducing the size of their lawns. Grass does not absorb water as well as plants, so Rich Philippi added a garden. Uh, the garden serves as, um, a, as a buffer to the house. It allows for a lot of absorption into the uh, ground. It's sloped away from the house. Uh, it's got a brick facing that, allow, that slows the water. Another homeowner strategy is to let part of your yard go wild. If even one-tenth of those people chose to let maybe a forest grow in the back part of their property, or certainly a five-foot strip around the border, that adds up to a lot of acreage in a very short time. 
Another affordable solution is a rain barrel. Priscilla Felder just bought one. She'll be able to make good use of the water that now pours off her roof. First, she'll hook it up to her downspout. We're going to cut it here and divert it so that it pours into this part of the system. Up here is a screen that filters out leaves and critters so that nothing's going to get in there you don't want in the water. When the barrel fills with water, she can simply attach a hose to it, turn on the barrel's faucet, and water her plants. Jane Grant uses a different kind of rain barrel. Water flows off her roof into the gutter and down a rain chain that she has attached. It works the same way as a downspout, but creates a beautiful water feature. The water falls into a rain barrel for later use. That's also great for watering your garden. It's better water for the plants, and it's conserving water, too. You can also plant a rain garden. When Jane moved into her house, her backyard had a lot of standing water. It was grass when I bought it, and it, so it was just mushy grass. So last year, she pulled out the grass and planted a perennial rain garden with turtle heads, red cardinal flowers, purple hyssops, and lots of other flowers, shrubs, and trees that thrive in wet soil. As they get bigger, they'll use up enormous quantities of this underground water, which is standing about a foot below the surface. You can also control water with a bioswale. Very simply, it's a piece of land scooped out in lower ground to catch rainwater and runoff from higher ground. It's much like a temporary pond, which slowly releases its water into the ground. A more expensive option is a dry well, which requires engineering design work and local permits. A dry well is an excavated pit filled with stone. Water from rooftops flows into it, and it's stored here temporarily until it seeps into the ground. If you want to go all out in preventing flooding, build a green roof. The top of this building at the Queen's Botanical Gardens is one example. It was built on a slope so the public can walk on it and see the greenery firsthand. It's designed by using a shallow layer of a lightweight growing medium similar to soil. Then you add a lot of beautiful, low-maintenance plants. The most typical green roof plant is uh, sedum. Uh, sedums are drought tolerant. They have a shallow root system um, and they provide ground cover throughout the year. These plants absorb water, store it, and gently allow it to evaporate instead of running off the roof and adding to flooding. A green roof can absorb up to 80 to 100 percent of a typical rainfall. Remember those impervious surfaces like parking lots that help create floods? How about creating one that's water friendly? The Queen's Botanical Gardens is setting a new standard for parking lots. We're calling it a parking garden instead of a parking lot because it's absorbing stormwater where it falls. Workers will lay down a filter fabric, then a layer of rocks, followed by a smaller, more gravel-like drainage layer. On top, they will place a series of interlocking pavers. There's space in between them, which allows rainwater to seep in. Jane Grant used that concept when creating pathways in her rain garden. She put down a one-inch layer of gravel in between the flower beds. All the water can filter through into the ground and slowly dissipate rather than running off quickly as it would off a non-permeable surface. The flooding problem in our watershed is created by many individual parking lots, driveways, and rooftops. So too, the solution depends on the multiplied efforts of every individual. If we all do our part, we can have flood control at very little cost.